So just very briefly, um, the two topics that I'll be backgrounding are fossil fuel divestment um, and the whole conversation that's been taking shape over the last three years or so on, on vulnerable carbon or uh, the carbon bubble. And one thing that I really want to leave with you, if I could just have the next slide, please, um, is that things really are speeding up. Um, there is so much conversation, discussion, expectation, and obviously urgency around this that it's both things all at once. It's a really scary time, but also an incredibly exciting time uh, to be a part of this conversation. And obviously, investments are a fundamentally important uh, part of it. Um, on fossil fuel divestment, um, again, possibly, probably covering ground that, you, that you've uh, been following to, to some extent so far, um, it's the idea that institutions, in the next slide, please, particularly uh, post-secondary institutions um, and uh, municipalities um, have an ethical obligation, it's being argued, to drop their uh, investments uh, in uh, oil, gas, and coal. Um, there has been a lot of pressure on banks, on investment funds, on colleges and universities. A number of municipalities have begun taking steps to uh, to drop their uh, fossil fuel investments. A study from Oxford University about a year and a half ago found that um, the uh, fossil fuel divestment movement is tracking faster, in fact, um, than the anti-apartheid divestment movement of about 30 years ago. Um, countering that, and we're having some trouble with the, the slide transfers here, so I'm just going to keep going and then I guess keep this slide up as we go. Um, um, there's some pushback when you see an institution like Stanford, which, by the way, was one of the starting points for the anti-apartheid uh, divestment movement uh, decades ago. Um, some of the reaction when Stanford agreed, uh, announced that it was moving in, moving in the direction of divestment was, well, that's fine. You know, coal stocks are tanking anyway. You, you, you should be doing this anyway. Where's the ethical involvement here? Um, and also, I guess, a, a point made in the Oxford study that while uh, divestment is an important part of the picture, it is a very important way of mobilizing public and particularly student interest um, in climate change and in what we can all be doing about it, that it won't be decisive. Um, that at, at the end of the day there will always be somebody who will still be prepared um, to, uh, to invest in fossil fuels as long as they can make money at it. And that takes us two slides ahead, please, if it's possible to catch up um, to the conversation about unburnable carbon. And then the next one, please. Um, the um, basic argument is that 80% of known fossil fuel reserves are unburnable in any reasonable um, climate change scenario. Um, this is research that was first done by the Carbon Tracker Initiative in London, UK in 2011. They've been backing it up and others have been as well with reams of research since. The story was popularized by Bill McKibben of 350.org in an article in the summer of 2012 in Rolling Stone magazine called Global Warming's uh, Terrifying New Math. And he brought it down to three numbers. So the first, next slide please, um, two degrees Celsius. Um, that is just about arguably the only useful thing that governments of the world have agreed on in more than 20 years of climate negotiations, and that is that two degrees Celsius or less is the science-based target for limiting um, average global warming. Um, the second number on the next slide, please, is uh, 565 gigatons. That's 565 billion metric tons, and that is basically our carbon budget until 2050. Uh, it is the amount of carbon calculated that we can afford to emit globally to have an 80% chance of hitting the 2 degrees Celsius target. And as McKibben says in, in his article, an 80% chance is some, somewhat worse odds than you would get if you decided to play Russian roulette with a six-shooter. But 80% is 80%, and we all think it's worth going for, obviously. Um, two things are true about the 565. One is that 565 billion tons is an incomprehensible number to any of us. And the second thing that's true is that if present trends continue, we're going to blow through the target somewhere around 2029, according to the research that's out there to date. So the third number on the next slide, please, um, is 2,795 gigatons. And that is the emissions value of the fossil fuel reserves that have already been discovered. And crucially, Next slide, please. The fossil fuels that are reflected in fossil fuel companies' balance sheets. The assumption inherent in those balance sheets is that all of those fuels will be burned. So the assumption is governments will not take serious action on climate change. Um, the rest of us will either object ineffectively or stop objecting. I don't know what the expectation is, but those fuels will be burned. 
Um, and so the risk that the, the risk that is being strongly suggested for those companies is that 80% of their balance sheet is alive, that 80% of their stock value is vulnerable uh, in the event, essentially, that the rest of us do the sensible thing and start taking action on climate change. Very, very quickly, there are a few other forms of risk. On the next slide, please. Thanks. You're very good. Um, um, a few other forms of risk um, facing fossil fuel stocks. The volatility um, of uh, fossil fuel markets right now. Uh, oil and gas prices are said to be low. Whoever knew that $80 a barrel would ever be seen as low. But it's volatile. It's unpredictable. Um, the next slide, please. The um, massive um, plummet in cost in in renewable energy sources, in energy efficiency, the increase in energy productivity across the economy that is beginning to cut into the market for fossil fuels. Um, next slide, please. Very long project horizons. You know, it takes so much longer to get a, a fossil fuel mega project on the ground than it does to build a wind farm or produce a solar project, even a large one, much, much less the kind of smaller scale project that you'll be hearing about from Janice later on. Um, and so more can change if there's a longer time horizon. And that might be one of the explanations for some research that was published in the last month or two by Ernst & Young showing that 64% of fossil fuel mega projects worth a billion dollars or more came in over budget, and 73% of them came in behind schedule. Um, I don't know how many people here have had responsibility either for managing budgets, managing project schedules, or both. I would not want to be responsible for a series of projects that were 64% likely to come in under budget and seven, uh, over budget and 73% behind schedule. And then finally, um, the potential liability that they face for climate losses. This is a study that was published last week or the previous by the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and West Coast Environmental Law that calculated $2.4 billion per year in potential liability just for five major Canadian oil and gas companies um, as a result of the climate impacts of their, uh, of their operations. And it was suggested. I mean, it's not a done deal. Nobody can say where that litigation would eventually go, but the concern is beginning to be expressed. And I think in, in some very effective ways. So when I suggested that things are moving fast, um, when we begin to see, for example, that the Rockefeller Foundation, um, acknowledging the irony of what they're saying, begins to talk about divesting its fossil fuel assets, when the heirs to the Rockefeller fortune are heard to say that they believe that the original Rockefeller, John D., as an entrepreneur, would be looking to renewables and clean tech as the way of the future if he were alive and investing today. When we see Mark Carney last week, um, we all knew or knew of Mark Carney as the governor of the Bank of Canada until he went on to his new gig, and it's as governor of the Bank of England that he's saying that most fossil fuels are, uh, are unburnable, that the uh, vast majority of known fossil fuel reserves are, are unburnable. This is really an indication of how quickly the conversation is picking up, how fast things are moving, and that's all the more reason that I'm so glad that you're all here to hear our panelists, to share your own knowledge, to engage in the discussion. So with that, I am pleased to pass the mic to our first speaker, Andrea Moffat. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mitchell, and thanks to Janice and, and to Emily um, for putting this together. It's fun to be here. Um, and um, I'm going to start off, I'm actually going to go to slide two, just by introducing um, Ceres a little bit, because we are a U.S. headquartered NGO, so some of you might not be very familiar with the organization. Um, and as Mitchell said, we really are um, focused on how do we get sustainability, so environmental, social governance issues, into the capital markets. <laughs> And we're a collaborative group, so you can see on the slide we've got like a number of different uh, networks that we run and organize and do a lot of different activities with. And today I'm just going to focus on the investor network. So going to the next slide, um, Ceres does have a network of uh, institutional investors. It's called the Investor Network on Climate Risk, or INCR. And this network is really focused on what's happening in terms of risks and opportunities associated with both climate and sustainability issues. And as you you can see on the slide, um, our membership has really grown over the past 10 years. Um, and we've got over 100 institutional investors, um, and they have assets about $13 trillion under management. So it's a fairly influential group. Um, 
institutional investors, for those that aren't familiar, really are the largest investors out there. When, so when I say institutional investors, I'm talking about pension funds, large asset managers, money managers, private, private equity firms, and, and groups of that nature. Um, and um, they're influential for a bunch of reasons. Uh, a couple of the reasons are that, especially the pension funds, they tend to own the market. And what that means is they actually own shares in most companies that are publicly traded on stock exchanges. Um, so they have you know quite a bit of influence there. Pension funds also are long-term investors. You know they are obligated to provide to their members in sort of a 50, 60-year cycle. So if you're a teacher and you're a member of a pension fund or if you're a public servant and you're a member of a pension fund, there's that long-term cycle of benefits that um, need to be paid out to you. Um, so they're a very influential group. Going to the next slide. So then it comes down to, you know, so why do they care about climate change and why do they care about clean energy? Um, and, you know, investors really look at things in terms of both risks and also opportunities. Um, and they're very much looking for market certainty so that they can really make the best investment decisions um, at the right time. So when you think about climate change, climate change brings a lot of uncertainty, particularly into the marketplace. And I've tried to pull out some examples of this uncertainty, and, and Mitchell certainly raised a couple in his talk. So um, when you look at physical risk, uh, of climate change. You can think about some of the weather events that we've experienced in various places. So you can think about um, the floods in Calgary, for example, with the cost estimated at about $6 billion. Um, we also um, had a lot of impact from Hurricane Sandy in New York, and that cost the insurance industry about $20 billion. So that, that's, that's quite a bit of money that impacts investors who, who own those companies and that infrastructure. Um, I also want to pull out supply chain because it's kind of an area of risk that sometimes people don't think about. You know, how does that impact the investment community? So when I think about another kind of weather event related to supply chain, there was tremendous floods in Thailand in 2011. And what that did is it really impacted the supply chains of technology and auto companies. So it impacted both Apple and Toyota in terms of the hard drives that are going into their products. So it sometimes steps away that you don't really think about how climate could impact investors, but it does. Um, in terms of stranded assets, Assets in the carbon bubble. I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to use the term carbon asset risk, which is a slightly different concept, but related to what Mitchell talked about. And then finally, I want to mention water again. So when you look at sort of the risk around water issues, the drought in California is kind of what comes to mind right now, and that's basically costing the state an estimated $2.2 billion, and also 17,000 um, jobs from agricultural workers are impacted um, from that, and that they're also starting to tax their groundwater supplies, so it's going to have a longer-term impact. So all of these things basically illustrate the kind of monetary impacts that climate change can have, have to the investment community. So going to the next slide, um, you know, let's look at what and some investors are starting to do about it. How are investors starting to act on climate change? And I just had to um, show a picture of um, the UN Climate Week that happened not that long ago. Um, and as many of you heard, there was 400,000 people in New York City that marched. Um, it was the largest climate demonstration in history. And many investors were very active participants in the march. So you can see a picture of the investors all gathering to march. Um, and going to the next slide, so in addition to marching, investors in their sort of traditional way also wanted to make sure that those um, at the UN and dignitaries and others really heard their perspective on climate change. Um, so a statement was released and this was a coordinated statement of um, a lot of the global investor coalitions. So this are groups um, such as our, our group, the Series Investor Network on Climate risk, but also the principles for responsible investment, the UN um, uh, financial initiative, and also investor networks from both Asia and Europe. So a big, big coordinated effort. And it ended up actually totaling about 350 institutional investors that manage $24 trillion of assets. 
And just to put that into perspective, because I'm using a lot of big numbers, which are hard to grasp. I know I have hard trouble grasping them. When you look at the size of the world stock market, it's about $55 trillion. So this is almost half of that in terms of asking for action by government on climate. And what they were asking for is really kind of three things. They would like to see a price on carbon, because they want certainty in the market, which I mentioned before. They want a phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, and they also want want a strong global agreement on climate change by 2015. So that, that, that statement's available on our website and other things. And when you look at sort of what are they concerned about, so why did they bother to sort of, you know, rally themselves and put this together, what they're worried about is if there's delays or gaps or sort of weakness in terms of climate and energy policy, it's going to increase the risk to their investments, some of those risks that I pointed out on the previous slides. And it's also going to increase the likelihood that more radical policy is going to be have to put in place, and they're worried that's going to cost a lot more money and will impact them going forward. So going um, to the next slide, I wanted to talk about um, this shift of capital. So how do we start to shift from um, you know, a high-carbon-based high -carbon economy to a low-carbon economy? And I'm going to start with the high-carbon economy, and I'm going to um, reference some of the things that, that Mitchell referenced as well, um, but probably from some slightly different studies. So um, when I, we look at high carbon, it's the International Energy Agency that really estimated that two-thirds of the world's proven reserves of fossil fuels really can't be consumed if we're going to stay, um, you know, if we're going to limit the rise in global temperatures to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, or that's like 450 parts per million of CO2. Um, so that's, um, that's you know, kind of the baseline that we're working with when we look at this, this two degrees, which Mitchell mentioned. Um, but while we're understanding these scientific limits, these sort of economic limits, um, we're also seeing an increase in investment. So the world's largest 200 publicly uh, traded fossil fuel companies collectively spent about $674 billion in 2012 alone on finding and developing new reserves. So that's sort of a really big disconnect in terms of where money's going and where there might be limits in terms of, of climate. Um, and that's raised concerns in terms of whether shareholder capital, so investor capital, is being wasted on reserves that are likely to become what's often called stranded assets um, as the world starts to transition to less carbon-intensive fuels. So lots of concerns there. Um, for, from Ceres' perspective, we launched something called the Carbon Asset Initiative, and this was really to start to address this issue. And we partnered with 75 institutional investors and also a group called the Carbon Tracker. They're one of our partners to send out a very specific letter to the 45 largest fossil fuel companies. Um, and so when I talk about those 45 companies, we're talking about coal companies, oil and gas companies, and power companies. And, and what that letter and what the investors were looking are looking for um, companies to do is to recognize their exposure to carbon risk, to develop management strategies, and disclose those strategies um, using different types of scenarios, both a business as usual as well as a low low carbon scenario. Um, and when they when when they mention this idea of management strategies, you know what are they expecting these companies to do? They're they're not expecting companies to make a sudden shift out of fossil fuels because that's not not possible and they would lose their investment dollars, right, which they don't want to lose. But they are really looking to see from companies on how they're going to reduce the intensity of their assets, um, whether they would divest some of their more carbon-intensive assets, whether they would diversify their businesses more to invest in uh, lower carbon energy sources, or whether they would return some additional capital to investors versus putting it into potentially stranded assets going forward. So shifting over to the, the low carbon side of things, um, you know, there's a number of actions that investors are taking on the sort of the positive. How do we sort of move forward on, on clean energy? And we launched something called the Clean Trillion Initiative. And this is also based on the International Energy Agency analysis, where they said that to limit warming to two degrees, we also need to put in play $44 trillion of investments in clean energy by 2050. 
And so when you think about who's going to make those invest in investments, it's going to be governments, it's going to be companies, it's going to be institutional investors that are going to help um, move that forward. So it's a huge investment opportunity for investors. And we're calling it the clean trillion because the idea is how could you get a trillion dollars worth of capital flow into things like energy efficiency, renewable energy, whether it be solar, wind, geothermal, others, power storage, fuel cells, and more. Um, so how do you get the money to move? And it's been really interesting because we've actually started to see some institutional investors actually start to shift their dollars. And so a cup, just a couple of examples on that. We've got the um, California State Teachers Retirement System, or CalSTRS, and they've announced plans to increase their investment. Right now they've got investments in, in clean energy about $1.4 billion, and they're going to increase that to $3.7 billion over the next five years. That's a really big increase. They're also saying if there is going to be a meaningful price on carbon, they'll go even further and take that investment out to $9.5 billion, which would be enormous. Um, we also have a, the, one of the global banks, um, ING, has made a commitment to reduce its, its basically its loan allocation and financing to coal power from 63% down to 13%. And then they're going to increase their allocation um, uh, to renewable energy from 5% to 39%. So they're actually really starting to make a shift, which is really interesting. Um, and I'll just go to um, my, my next slide, which is really about, you know, I've talked about some of the actions that investors are starting to take and how they're starting to shift money. But one of the things that's really important is they actually need the tools to be able to do that. How do you actually have the right information and tools? And there's been a huge change that's been happening in that field that's related to this. And what I've got here is a snapshot of a Bloomberg screen. So Bloomberg is a data and, and analytics and media company that's really focused on the financial markets. Um, and they're extensively used by financial analysts, portfolio managers to really determine and track investment strategies. Um, and Bloomberg has actually put up over the past kind of three years a really extensive amount of environmental, social, and governance information onto their, their platform so that it can be used easily by investors. And more recently, they're actually testing different scenarios around carbon risk and portfolios. So as a portfolio manager, you can actually test out your portfolio to see how how to adjust the carbon risk that you're finding in there. And that's really interesting because it allows uh, investors to really compare themselves to financial be benchmarks on whether they've got energy companies a part of their portfolio. And there's many other groups that are starting to follow that suit in the sort of financial analytics space. And I can go through some of those that are, that are interested. So just to wrap very quickly, I'll go to the last slide. Um, you know, institutional investors are starting to take action on climate change through a number of mechanisms. They're pushing government to set a price on carbon. They're engaging directly with companies on their carbon risk. They're assessing carbon in their portfolios and they're investing directly in renewable energy and clean energy. Now, I'd say there's still, we need to have a lot more institutional investors join this group of investors that are doing it. And many of you would actually be part of pension funds and also mutual funds. And I hope that you have an opportunity to start to ask them what they're doing with regards to these types of risks with uh, the money that they're managing for you as part of your pension funds. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Andrew. Next, we will hear from John Hastings from RBC Dominion Securities. I run a wealth management practice here in Ottawa, and, and I started probably a year ago. And, and the reason why I started was because I did this market scan, and, and I was looking around at all the folks here in Ottawa in terms of the folks who, who are in my position and trying to understand what it is they do and how they're helping everyone in this audience and, and in Ottawa and the surrounding area divest and, and actually make a difference and, and get away from, from, from carbon and, and, and address that risk and address the values that I'm sure a lot of you all share. Um, and it's a challenge, and it's a serious challenge because there's no one here. So I took that sort of call to action and, and said, you know what, it's, it's my time to, to go in there and, and make a difference and provide the opportunity for, for, for folks to, to, to invest socially responsibly and make those sort of decisions and, and have that impact. So part of my job is understanding you know, where everyone is today or where you are today, where you want to go in the future, and put together a plan that reduces any inefficiencies and, and minimizes risk. 
And so Andrea and Mitchell have done a great job sort of elaborating on all the risks that we see today and, you know, in the media and, and, and whatnot that we read on a daily basis. The risks are very obvious, and, and there's something that, that we need to address. So when I put together plans and when I put together investment strategies, it, it looks at that component significantly. And when we're talking about a long-term strategy, it says, okay, well, well, how can I ensure that my personal portfolio doesn't have that risk? Is making that difference in, in getting away from, from carbon and, and climate change and, and having an impact? The other point that I, I realized when I decided to join RBC and, and, and start my own wealth management practice was the, was the idea that wealth is a powerful driver. You know, in, in my years before I was on the national kayak team and I had the opportunity to kind of speak to groups and groups of individuals on, okay, how can we, just with our own actions and behaviors, you know, make a difference and, and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And so the message I was preaching then was, well, you know, reduce your, your modes of, of, of passive transportation or, or using cars and, and carbon emitting sources and adopt more active, you know, means of transportation, right? And it seemed to make a lot of logical sense to me, but no action was really taking place. People weren't moving. So what I realized was that, you know, what it is, it's, it's money that really drives things. And, and in the actions that we saw in September with the Rockefellers divesting and, and making this action and endowments coming in after that, making the same sort of actions, you realize that, yeah, money is a powerful driver. And this is what actually makes change. So in addition to understanding the risk of climate change and seeing it worldwide and, and hearing about the impact it's having on our, on our society and our world, I said, okay, well, one of the big things that we can do is make a change, is, is use our wealth to, to influence change. So that's why you invest in companies and, and why my equity model is investing in companies that are doing good stuff for the environment. And not only that, it's investing in companies that are treating their employees well and, and are equitable and fair and have good governance structures. And that's sort of the under, underpinnings and, and foundation of a social responsible investing mandate. It's looking at companies that are doing good for the environment, treating their employees well, and are fair and equitable. And it's this model that I'm pushing forward, and I'm trying to make a difference and do my part and help everyone else do their part to make a difference as well. Because, you know, if you're like, if you're like anyone else, you're, you're hearing all this information, you're seeing all these institutions, you know, they're, they're making action. And you're asking yourself, what can I do? You know, maybe you go and buy yourself a hybrid, maybe you decide to ride your bike a little bit more. But there's more to that story. And that story, what I've learned over time and experience and research, is that wealth really does move things and makes things change. And so if there's a company that all of a sudden is doing something great, like installing solar panels, <coughs> changing their, their whole energy, energy model and, and looking at that risk and assessing it and pricing it into their business, you know what, those are the guys that are going to be attracting investors like you and I because we see that they're making a difference and that they're adapting and, and trying to solve this, this problem that's, that's right at the forefront. We can see it. It's right there. So those companies that aren't making a difference, that aren't changing, well, guess what? They're going to make a difference, too. They're going to change their models. Otherwise, they're going to face challenges with their going concern. So in, in, in conclusion, it's all about being able to, to make a difference. And, and our actions are important, but our wealth, that's where you're going to really see the change happen. And using our wealth in a positive way to make that change, well, not only is it, is it fiscally responsible for you, but it's also really responsible for, for, for the society and, and ensuring that it's here for, for years to come and, and, our, and our followings and our grandchildren and our children. So thank you. And I was actually supposed to say this before John came to the mic, just a word of thanks for the effort you just saw John make to uh, make this event a PowerPoint free zone. The rest of us didn't follow him, but it was a uh, great effort. <laughs> um, uh, next is Janice Ashworth, the operations manager for ORET. Thank you, Mitchell, for uh, moderating tonight, and thank you all for being here. 
Um, this discussion is so pertinent with regards to um, the urgency that we face for climate change, as we've heard from Mitchell, as well as, in, in my perspective, the two, um, the two issues that intersect in the conversation we're having tonight are the two that are the most pertinent uh, to, our, to this day and age, and those are both the, the climate emergency, the env environmental emergency there, um, or urgency, and also the social capital um, social capital degradation that we're seeing. So right now, the, um, the major reason why we're here tonight is because corporate corporate uh, values have overtaken or, or are steering the direction of our um, society and our governments, and in many ways, the way that many individuals choose their their. Um, their lifestyles and their path forward. And I think that that doesn't necessarily relate or reflect the human values that each of us hold in our hearts and know that um, we would, how we would like to, to paint our own future. And so that's what I'm here to talk about, um, how those two um, scenarios can, can intersect in a business, scenario, in a business case such as the um, Ottawa Renewable Energy Co-op that I'll talk about. Uh, next slide, Matt. So what is OREC, Ottawa Renewable Energy Co-op? Um, we were a renewable energy co-op incorporated in 2010, which is relatively new, but at the time it was only the third such co-op in the province because this type of co-op was only defined in 2009. Um, we cr were created as a way for Ottawa citizens to jointly in own and, and invest in renewable energy assets in their own city. Um, it, says it creates a, a tangible, sustainable investment opportunity for individuals. Thanks, Matt. Next one. Why cooperatives? How do cooperatives um, make a difference? The seven things that make cooperatives different from any other corporation are really these seven tenants, and you can't see them but very clearly, I suppose, but um, the main one that people know about is the democratic governance model. So one member, one vote, regardless of how many shares you've invested in, um, how, many, how much equity you, you hold in the co-op, you still get the same vote as everyone else, which is um, a democratic model equated to our, our democratic society. Uh, the other one that is of interest is concern for community, number seven, and that's an, an inherent, built-in built inherent um, value that, that all co-ops have to adhere to, as well as education and training. So there's some giving back to the community through educational type opportunities like this, as well as um, our, our values as a, as a business must align to some sort of benefit to the community. Um, there's also cooperation. We cannot be bought out, autonomy and independence, um, open membership. There's no discrimination. What else is interesting about co-ops is, is that they're the only business model right now that is that inherently um, must tie to, the, to adhere to those social values. The interesting thing about co-ops is that they have the, twice the survival rate of any other corporation in terms of longevity, um, surviving past the five-year mark, the ten-year mark. Um, so that means that there's other benefits that, that they're bringing to the community that aren't just financial, and you can see that in the in the model. Um, in, they're also a, a vehicle. The reason that I'm interested in working for a cooperative is that it's a vehicle that allows a, the the um, the rapid opportunity shifting of, of individual members um, investing in something that is not uh, that, that otherwise would not be available. So it it um, mobilizes private financing in such a way that builds the future at the speed that we need to build it. Ontario as a province has recognized cooperatives um, as also building a social license to operate for certain types of certain types of industries, and so that's why they've prioritized cooperatives in the energy sector. Go ahead, Matt. How do, how do renewables help protect both the economy and the environment? First, the economy. Um, Renewable uh, investments in renewable energy for every 75 cents um, invested in conventional energy, that's, uh, for every, every dollar, 75 cents of that is leaving the local economy. Um, whereas for renewables, that there's about a five, five to ten times um, ripple, a ripple effect through the local economy when invested in, in renewables versus conventional, and that's from the Iowa Policy Project, they, th those numbers. Uh, for every dollar that's invested in a local economy, that has a ripple effect of three times through that local economy by um, investments staying, staying within the, the, the region. Renewables also help to stabilize costs. So, for example, the contracts that we have to, to generate renewable power, those rates are fixed for 20 years, and that helps keep our energy prices as a province stabilized. Um, the other interest, uh, also on the on the economic side, there's about uh, there's over 27 billion dollars in um, in private sector investment that has been brought into Ontario as a result of the renewable energy policies that uh, have only existed here since 2009, and that's created about 20,000 jobs. 
On the environment side, of course, greenhouse uh, renewable energies um, technologies do not emit, emit any greenhouse gases, nor do they have any air pollutant emissions. Um, they're also, they also are technologies that can generate power in an urban area, which helps us have a more efficient electricity system overall by reducing transmission losses. Um, Renewables can also power at the time that we need it. So, for example, solar uh, solar energy powers at, during those hot summer days when everyone's air conditioning is is operating and uh, we have our peak power consumption um, on those those hot August afternoons. Um, and as Mitchell mentioned, it can be it's a reliable source of power because it's more distributed throughout the, the geographic region. We won't have the same blackout, um, uh, you know, blackouts sweeping across the province as we did in 2003 with a more distributed energy model. Next one, Matt. Trends. This is an interesting um, a stat that was just released a few weeks ago, that there's more Canadians now who work in renewable energy than in the, the tar sands, uh, which, is, which is a great tipping point. Uh, by 2025, it's predicted that Ontario will be about 50% renewably powered, so that will continue to, to increase from about um, 25 to 30% today. They're also a good chunk of that will be um, will be community owned and public owned. That's the, the fastest growing sector right now in the renewable energy sector, and that's specifically here in Ontario because of government policies that prioritize that ownership. Um, worldwide, there are investments in clean energy that there are more investments in clean energy than in fossil fuels, and that's been the case since 2011. So we've seen we've seen that tipping point. On the ethical investment side, um, that's also a growing trend. There's a hockey stick, or a hockey stick sort of approach happening there, um, and that's about 50 billion in assets right now are held under ethically invested uh, funds, and that will, the growth potential there is up to 500 billion in assets um, within the next number of years. Next one, Matt. Uh, from OREC's point of view, where we sort of plugged into had our very small slice of the pie in this in this growing industry, um, like I said, we incorporated in 2010. Keep going. We have 292 members right now, um, all residents of Ottawa, individuals. We were the first renewable energy co-op in the province to have our share offering approved by the regulator, the Financial Services Commission. So we were giving ourselves a pat on the back. Go ahead, Matt. Um, at that point. In 2012, we had our first offering. We went to the community green and said, what do you think? We had a million dollars come back in the in, in, in our president's mailbox, um, which was quite a shock within about two months. And so that showed that there was a real uh, desire for this type of investment vehicle. Um, the second offering that we did, we, we, we raised a million and a 1.25 million um, in 2013. And, uh, and now we're open for three million, and that just opened a few uh, about a month ago. So I'm happy to talk a bit more about that later. With that, we've financed seven solar rooftop projects. We have six more under development now, um, four of which are all are on high schools, which is a really neat uh, tying in cooperative tenant number six, which is the concern for community and, and education value. Um, so that's an exciting um, portfolio that we have on the table right now of six new projects. That's what the three million um, share purchase or share portfolio. Portfolio will be will be financing. How it works? We identify rooftops um, around Ottawa where, that we can rent for 20 years. We then apply for a feed and tariff contract for to produce power into the grid. Um, we oversee the construction and we sign 20-year feed and tariff agreements when that um, when that system is connected to the grid. Go ahead, Matt. On the investment side, we then go to our membership and say, who would like to invest in these projects? Our members, um, to become a member, it's a $100 lifetime membership share. Members can then pur purchase preference shares of $500 increments, um, up to $100,000 maximum. Minimum is $2,500 buy-in. Those can also be RRSP eligible. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. Um, members then receive annual dividends on their investment, as well as a return of their capital. This series opened um, in August. We expect to close at the end of February or until it sells out. Um, it's RRSP eligible, so that can be transfers of existing RRSP funds or new contributions. Um, minimum buy-in is 2,500. RRSP eligibility starts at the 5,000 mark, and the maximum over all three series that we have so far is 100,000 for uh, per member. Go ahead, Matt. This is a, an example of the, the, the return on investment. So for the first five years, it's a dividend-only return. And then starting in year six, we pay back a portion of the capital each year. And that's 1 15th. So the, the, port, the capital return is, is, um, is linear at that point, And the, the overall return to the members starts to decline as, with a declining balance of capital. So the largest lump sum is returned in year six. And you can see it declines slightly after that. It's a 20-year preference share. 
um, transferable to other members, so members can sell their shares to other members, but not publicly because we're not publicly traded, um, and that's the that's the nature of cooperatives. There's also an option that the co-op itself could buy back members' shares at any um, at, at various points throughout the years, throughout the 20 years, if members need their cash back at various points. Go ahead, Matt. How does that help mitigate portfolio risk? So from an OREC uh, share perspective, we because our contracts, are, our feed-in tariff contracts, are with the Ontario Power Authority, that's a government entity. We think that those contracts are fairly secure. Um, even, even the fairly right of right who, um, conservatives haven't said that they would cancel those contracts. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sure thing. And for 20 years, we have a guaranteed price for those contracts, which is the feed-in tariff rate, a guaranteed buyer um, for our electricity. Solar is nice because it has very few, um, it requires very little maintenance. Um, only the inverters have moving parts and, and electrical components that need to be replaced, but uh, otherwise the panels themselves, sorry, operate for, uh, operate for 30 plus years um, with only slight degradations per year, so there's very little maintenance or moving parts required. There's no fuel costs, um, which is nice helps us guarantee our rates for 20 years. And then the um, other variable is the sunshine, and that goes up and down based on Environment Canada weather data. We've seen that go up and down by about 3% per year. Um, the average is, is about 3% difference. Go ahead, Matt. You can contact me at, at any of those details at the front or at, on the way out. There's um, My card is there as well as our information about how to become a member, investor, or um, preference shareholder. Thanks very much.